hair messed up? of consciousness everywhere by singing sweet spirit come on praise team sweet spirit sweet spirit take over this place is that carry take over this place oh sweet spirit sweet spirit take over this place This place. Take it over. Take over this place. Say it again, sweet spirit. Take it over. Take over this place. Oh, sweet spirit. Sweet spirit. Sweet spirit. Take over this place. 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 Take over this place.
your very own Center for Spiritual Living in San Jose. Here, every day of the week, lives are transformed, dreams are being built, and truth is being revealed. And it's all based on this premise that we be open just to the possibility of changing our entire life by changing our mind. Welcome home. My name is Paula Stapleton, and you may or may not know that I am a unlicensed non-professional prayer practicer. I am also a member of this community, and I am delighted to be your host this morning. If this is your first time with us, thank you so much for sharing your Sunday morning with us. Uh, we actually have a welcome packet for you, and you can get it um, in the fellowship hall at the concierge desk after the service, or you can get it in the lobby if you exit the room that way. Um, there's lots of ways you can get information about the center. You have a bulletin you received when you walk in the door. There are flyers on the walls outside. We have a website. We have a mobile app, and you can give us a call during the week. I also want to welcome our online community. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Your uh, moderator today is Anne, so if you have any questions, you can just type it on your screen and um, she will communicate with you there. And now um, this is our moment to celebrate that we get to be together and celebrate community. So please greet someone around you. So, my name is B.J. King, I'm Practitioner Emeritus, and I'm going to lead you through our, what I feel is one of the most sacred parts of our service. I have a reading, a call response, we will have a chant, followed by two minutes of silence, prayer, and an affirmation. And I encourage our live streamers to please join us. So please repeat after me. I hold in my heart the children and volunteers in our youth program. I hold in my heart the children and volunteers in our youth program. 
and members of our community who aren't here today. I hold in my heart our loved ones. Those who have gone before us and those who have yet to arrive. I hold in my heart all who need healing. I hold in my heart a world free of homelessness. A world free of violence. A world free of hunger. A world free of separation. I hold in my heart all beings and the vitality of the planet we share and a world that works for everyone. I feel the global heartbeat in me as me right here, right now.
in this sacred place where the light and love and joy of God has shown up today because of you. That we have been endowed with a gift of all that we could ever desire because that's the way God created us to be. And as we go into the throne room of our heart and stoke the fire and sit with our beloved, sit with spirit, God, all there is, and all we need do is just listen because God has a message for us. We can relax our bodies and we can let go of anything that is not for our highest good. Trusting and believing there is a power that is available to us all the time. And as we feel our shoulders relax and we just breathe, maybe for the first time today, we feel that presence of God touching us and saying all is well. We move into gratitude that we were able to even come today where we can move and take care of ourselves and do the things that bring us great joy and happiness. And I can let these words go now with authority, with freedom, with courage, because I know God's got it and has heard every word that you have said. And so I let it go and know that it is all well. And join me in anchoring by saying, and so it is. Please join me with the affirmation. The freedom of God is my freedom. And I now cease dwelling on limitation and give my earnest attention to the particular abundance I desire. The abundance of God fills my good desire right now. Yo 
struggles, but your trials will just make you strong. You can do anything, but you gotta believe, yes you can. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, here we go. Yes, I can. I can do. I can do anything if I try. But we gotta try. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning. My name is Mary Teresa, and I am your insight speaker this morning. I walked through the doors of the center here for the first time on the very first Sunday of 2010, after I'd spent the weekend away for the new year, just by myself, um, getting quiet and getting prepared for what was to come because 2009 um, is what now I fondly call the worst year of my life. And that year I started off with an infection on my face and two ointments didn't help, so they put me on an internal medication two weeks after which I broke into severe hives all over my body with my face so deformed that my daughter, my five-year-old at the time, looked at me crying, asking if I would ever look like her mommy again. And then I sprained my knee for the first time that year. I, I ended up spraining it again later that year. And um, three people that were very important to me in my life also passed away that year, in addition to a little boy in my daughter's kindergarten class where I volunteered, died of leukemia. And then there was the lice. So all three of my children had their first, second, and third rounds of lice all in the same year, which meant so did I. And I'd never had it before that time. So, and to top it all off, that was also the year that my husband, to whom I'd been married for 15 years, and with whom I'd had our three children, came out to me, told me that he is gay, and we, he subsequently moved out, and we filed for divorce. So you can see why I needed a weekend away. <laughs> And at the conclusion of that weekend, uh, this was the first place I drove to. Actually, my husband had told me about the center, but I hadn't been here before. And I drove straight here that morning and came in to this amazing place. And I was ready for a new start, for sure. And I felt like it was the start of a new life for me, really. It, the past five years have felt kind of like I've been walking through a fog, like the world is just filled with smoke and I'm just trudging through the swamp and not really knowing exactly where I'm going. But that morning it started for me with the invitation to open 
to the possibility, open myself to the possibility of it changing my entire life by changing my mind. And I thought, okay, I can do that. That's a good start. And as I started, uh, continued to come here, I learned about affirmative prayer which was amazing to me because my whole life, although I was always taught that I'm a child of God, I was also taught that I was less than, that I was not worthy somehow. And to find out that all these things God is, I am? What? That was amazing. So I started taking that in, and that was another light that opened up for me. And then I started taking classes. I took foundations with Dr. David and met some incredible people, and, and I take Beyond Limits with, with Reverend Susan, and more lights started showing up in my life on my path as I kept trudging through this swamp. And the people who came in and illuminated my way have just been incredible. In fact, when I was practicing this talk, I started listing every single person by name, and I was just in tears to think of how many of you have just lightened my life in the time that I've known you. And um, my life is kind of like a musical, so a lot of times things show up as songs as well. So all the musicians here, Michelle, and people who have come in like Faith Rivera and Margaret Owens, I've just been overwhelmed by, again, the light just shining and, and sparkling on my way. And then last Christmas, I was here for the candle lighting service, um, which if you've never been, um, every person gets to light a candle, and there are trays up here, and you bring your candle and put it in the tray and make your declaration for the new year. And Dr. David invited us to make an I am declaration, not so much for a resolution of something we want to do or accomplish, but who will you be in the new year? And that night I was here and Michelle was singing with the singers up here, chanting different songs as the rows would come up and light their candles. And when it got to my row, she was singing the song by India Ari, I am light. And for me, that was just so true. I just thought, that's, that's what I am. I am light, and I set my candle in that tray, knowing that, really, realizing it for the first time. And so I'm grateful for all the light that you have brought to my life and being here has brought. But what I realized is that as I'm walking along my path, it's no longer the light just coming from outside of me, from the universe, from all of you. I started to realize the light was coming from me. <laughs> so I keep walking. And today I just want to leave you with um, a song that just expresses just that. All those days watching from the window, all those years outside looking in, all that time never even knowing just how blind I'd been. Now I'm here blinking in the starlight, now I'm here, suddenly I see, standing here, it's crystal clear, I'm where I'm meant to be, and at last I see the light, and it's like the fog has lifted, and at last I see the light, and it's like the sky is new, and it's warm and real and bright, and the world has somehow shifted. All at once, everything is different now that I see you. All at once, everything is different now that I see me.
Good morning. Good morning, good morning. So Kevin Swanson is not here. He was in first service, so I can tell you now that he's not here. He's on the, Kevin's on the core council, which is our board of trustees, and Kevin and his wife last week were at Kevin's mother's wedding in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Kevin's mother is 83, and she married a man who's, who's 88. And when he was telling us this story in a core council meeting a couple weeks ago, uh, I noticed those who were not married suddenly felt hopeful again. <laughs> you know? But then Kevin shared what was happening with, with, his, uh, with his mom. Um, his mom, uh, a couple months back, she and her fiancé, the 88-year-old, were having a little bit of difficulty. And so Kevin went to Lake Avasu City to counsel with her a little bit. And she was a little distraught. And, and he said... Well, Mom, you know, you have a few things in his bathroom, and he has a few things in your bathroom, and you should just collect your things from his bathroom and give him his stuff from your bathroom, and then you guys can just get on with your lives separately. And she said to him, Kevin, I'm old-fashioned. Marriage is the only option once you've had sexual relations. <laughs> so, There's still hope. <laughs> Can you just see it? I know some of you are like, no! I don't mean that. All right, all right. So, our topic today, our topic today is don't say can't. And I looked in the dictionary to find out really what, what is can't, and I knew that can't, C-A-N apostrophe T, can't is a contraction. And can't is a contraction of cannot, C-A-N-N-O-T. So I looked up the definition of cannot, and cannot is, is defined as being one who can not. So I looked up, well, what, what does it mean to be cannot? And they said cannot is can't. And I thought... God bless anybody who, you know, that English is not their first language. How do you, what are you supposed to do with that? But the more I thought about it, see, I can not is actually can, but you're saying I can not do something. Like, like I, I can't do that. I can't get married again. I can't be happy. I can't be financially free. I, I can't get out of my depression. Basically, you're making an affirmation. I can not do it. There's, I can do it, and I can not do it. Either way, universal presence is, and so it is. Like, like, I can't get beyond this. I can't lose those extra 10 pounds. And the universal presence, and so it is. Not because God wants that or doesn't want it or is withholding it from you, but there's some part of you that's saying, I won't. It's a curious tendency, I've noticed. Uh, uh, going through the, the whole move process here back to South Bay, and uh, sometimes it, it, the process itself drags on a bit such that I get, I get into it and I forget that there's, there's another side. It's like diving into the ocean but being under there so long as the waves keep tumbling and, and I just want to come up for breath and I can't seem to come up for breath that it's easy to succumb to uh, or to want to just sort of succumb to the tide and just go, well, F it. But I can come through it, and will, did, and hope never to do it again. <laughs> I decided, Matt and I both looked at each other and said, we're not moving again, just shoot me. <laughs> just literally, shoot me and give it away, I don't care. Open the door, leave it unlocked, say, free, take it. I, I want nothing to do with it ever again, until I forget what this was like. They say that about childbearing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like lift, take your lower lip and lift it clear up over the top of your head. My mother would say that's what it was like. <laughs> Let me get back to my notes. <laughs> so, can't. Last night there was a dinner party at my house. It was the Gourmets for God event that had been auctioned off here at the center back at Easter time. And, and we had 16 guests and we had six people helping us make it happen. And it was magnificent. It was really beautiful. And there are so many stories being told by people that it's one of the reasons I wanted to move back to South Bay. I wanted to be back in community with the people that I love um, and so many of you that I love. 
and to have a home that's large enough to actually sit down and hang out with people until, until it's time to, to go home. And last night was one of those nights. And, and I wish I had time to tell you all the stories that I overheard, but there's just not enough time, and some of them are not appropriate for church. <laughs> but one in particular that I overheard really illustrated how one can move from can't to can and how an attitude of moving from can't to can can create workability. It was Jackie Kukine, and she was sitting across from me next to her husband, Paul, and both of them were extraordinarily um, world-wise and really amazing folks because they're sophisticated and they're down to earth at the same time. They are talented and well-educated and completely present for whatever's happening. And Jackie was telling us who were listening that at, the, um, at one point in her career, and her career was a, an agent, as I understand it, she would, she would every summer take about 40, 50 young men and women, high school graduates, first year university students, to Europe for, for uh, a month at a time. And she and probably seven other guides would, would take these young men and women in caravan. Caravan, there would be, like she said, I think there were eight or were there seven, Jackie? Seven. Seven Volkswagen buses. You remember Volkswagen vans? The, the, the Volkswagen vans? Seven of them. And they were colored red, white, blue, red, white, blue, and red. And it was the American contingency. How funny is that? That was God's doing. Anyway, she said that uh, one, one time they, she and the caravan of seven Volkswagen vans carrying 40-some-odd young men and women were headed up a, a treacherous mountain road in the Pyrenees. And, you know, it's not, it wasn't the United States where there are guardrails and double guardrails and, and uh, speed bumps and all kinds of things. There was, there was um, the road and a cliff. And she said she was driving the lead car and six were following her as they were zigzagging up this treacherous mountain road in the Pyrenees when the fog began to settle in. And the fog got thicker and thicker and thicker to the point that, as I understand it from her last night, she couldn't see from me to that lectern. And then you hear a voice in the van. We can't do this. Well, this is one of the beautiful things that emerges in group mind. See, one of us might think, can't do it. One of us might think, um, the move is too much. One of us might think, I just can't keep unpacking. One of us might think, I don't know how I'm going to get through this bankruptcy, this foreclosure, this illness. One of us might think, I don't know how I'm going to get through this trouble with my spouse or this divorce or um, the trouble with my kids. One of us might actually think that. But with group think, something begins to emerge. Synergy. And this is where the thing itself begins to be known and make its way revealed. Well, while one in the minivan or one in the Volkswagen van is saying, we can't do this, there was one young man who was a first-year student at San Jose State University who happened also to be a runner. So he got out of the van and began running up the mountain, tapping the front of the van so she would keep following him, and the other vans would follow very closely behind. Now, I'm touched and moved and inspired by a, uh, first off, a, a boy that we sp would be brave enough to run in front of Jackie. Because <laughs> I've seen her drive. But when you, just when you think you can't, some, some wisdom emerges. And, you know, can, did you just love a college kid that would run up a mountainside with seven Volkswagens chasing him up the mountainside to bring 42 of his, of his colleagues to safety? Yeah, that's the beauty of, of coming together. Last week I mentioned Simon Sinek, one of my, one of my current favorite uh, inspirational sources. And I mentioned a video that I was watching of his entitled, If You Don't Know Business, You Don't Know People. I'm sorry, if you don't know people, you don't know business. Because all of your business is about people. Everything about your business is about people. And at the end of his video, he begins to describe how there are so many people who are looking to be happy, 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 happy. And they might find happiness in their work, and they may find 
um, more money in their work, and they may find a little bit of satisfaction having done a good job. But 90% of people say about their work that they do not experience fulfillment. There's a distinction between being happy with your work and being fulfilled by your work. And there seems to be a missing ingredient that is common through most of the 90% of folk that, that have been surveyed about why they do not feel, feel fulfilled with their work. And that is because they're not in a state of giving or helping other people. Most people, when they're at work, they're sitting at their cubicle and they're just hammering away and doing their email. They're hammering away and trying to accomplish things or get their work done. And the only interaction people seem to be having now in work, at work is when they go to someone else's cubicle to get something to help them complete the work that they're doing. The missing ingredient nowadays seems to be that people are no longer leaving their cubicles or their workspaces to find out if they can be useful or helpful to the people around them. You know, instead of, instead of going to the people around you at work to see what you can get or what you need, you go there to find out what you can give or what you can, um, how you might be useful. And there is some uh, clear distinction between fulfillment and happiness that is not occurring when all we're trying to do is get something so that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish to do something that might bring us happiness, but it seems to be lacking fulfillment. Do you know that generosity is defined... Please say that's not my phone. It's not my phone. Good. It's, that we're good. Um, generosity is defined as, as helping or giving something or some act to another person without any need for repayment, with no expectation or expectancy that you will be reimbursed. So generosity is not a business transaction. I help you knowing you're going to help me. That's a business transaction. That might be nice and it might be sociable, but it's not necessarily generous. Generosity is just giving without any expectancy in return. And I have met people who are extremely poor. They have nothing, but they've been extraordinarily generous because they have given me their attention and their time and their presence. Generosity is, is not just actions. It's a way of showing up in the world. It's, it's a paradigm. It's a way of being. And being generous actually causes us to feel good. We actually feel good when we're generous. Now, um, I'll bet almost every one of you, almost every one of you knows that sex feels good. This is the part of the service I love. I get to watch a room get very silent. Like, I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to make noise or not make noise or smile or agree. Or, I don't know, am I supposed to agree? Wife, am I not supposed to agree? Does it feel good or doesn't it feel good? It feels good. If you don't remember, there was just a, a, a wedding in Lake Havasu City between an 83-year-old and an 88-year-old. Don't say can't. But it feels good by universal design. Mother Nature, the thing itself, has designed sex to feel good so that we will do it. Ricardo, when you're old enough and your mother says it's okay. <laughs> it's designed so that we, it feels good so that we do it, so that we procreate. It's by universal design so that we as a species survive. Generosity is the same. Being generous is designed to make you feel good so that we as a species survive. Think about the last time you gave something to a homeless person. We're going to steer clear of all the dialogues about whether or not it's useful or helpful or actually is counter helpful. Um, I'm going to leave that to the politicians and the other people who, who work in the city and the county and, and I'll partner with you to uh, see what we can do. But I'm going to put that aside for now. Every one of us has encountered a homeless person, and we either have or we have not passed and then and thrown, a, thrown a few coins into their cup, almost without fail, almost without fail, giving them the few coins causes us to feel good. And when we don't, I've noticed, 
two feelings happen for me. One is I feel nothing or I feel bad. I have never felt good about not giving, except the rare times when I'm cynical and then I get into a dialogue, but I'm really not feeling good about not giving. I'm actually having a dialogue and that person in front of me is not even present. You guys know what I'm talking about? But when we give, we feel good. And when we don't, we feel bad. That's the universe's design so that we survive because we need each other. As I mentioned last week, um, any of us, you going out to fight a saber-toothed tiger on your own, saber-toothed tiger one, you zero. But us as a group goes out against a saber-toothed tiger, we're likely going to succeed. We as a group, none of us is good at everything. None of us is good at everything. Some of us think we are. But honestly, none of us is good at everything. And the things about which we're not good at, when supplemented by the presence of someone who is good at it, creates function and workability and harmony, possibility, vitality, and, and opulence, which can create more generosity if we don't get into, this, the, um, into the uh, conservation mode. So last week, um, at, I mentioned Simon Sinek. Now, I don't remember if I mentioned two weeks ago in this service or in, in first service uh, about the woman who was a homeless woman in New York and Simon Sinek um, created an experiment with her. I think it was at the end of this service two weeks ago. But for those of you who weren't here, let me repeat it. Um, Simon, Simon uh, Sinek in New York City I did an experiment with a, with a homeless woman. He said he didn't, he didn't do an experiment on her, you know, like with electrodes and probes and things, but he did an experiment with her permission and her cooperation. See, he was watching this uh, particular homeless woman who sits at the same corner every day, and she makes between 20 and $30. On a good day, 30 bucks. That's the max, but she makes 30 bucks. And when she makes 30 bucks, she is thrilled. Her world is complete. Her life is amazing. And Simon noticed that her sign is the usual sign, the sign you see with most people standing on a street corner, the sign that says, I'm hungry, um, veteran, um, recovering alcoholic, um, pro-lesbian, pro-life to cover all bases, uh, military, ex-military, uh, I love you, um, hungry. You know, they have the sign. But the sign really is me, 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 my needs, my needs. I need my needs filled, my needs met. This is what happens in relationship a lot, too. I, I notice it for me, too, sometimes. I'm like, me, me, me. But that doesn't make me feel good. What makes me feel good is you, you, you. So Simon, with the experiment, rewrote her sign. And this woman who normally makes between 20 and $30 in 8 to 10 hours made $40 in 2 hours. And then she made $40 and she left. <laughs> now she left because that's probably why she lives the homeless life, that 40 bucks is like amazingly rich for her and she has no reason to stick around and create something new because now she can get on with her day. But the sign, now she had stuck around and followed that trend of 40 bucks in two hours. She could have made 150 bucks in a day. Had never happened for her before. The sign that Simon wrote for her said this. If you only give once per month, please think of me the next time. Her other sign was about me, me, me. The new sign was about you. If you only give once per month, if you only give once per month, please think of me the next time. Now, next Sunday is the last Sunday in October, and that is uh, the traditional month in which we have the altar call for the pledge cards for the year, and we're going to institute something new this year, and that is where we've created this, uh, this jar. And next Sunday in, in the bulletin will be um, one of 500 colored card stock, and each of these pieces of colored card stock are blank on the inside, so that you might actually write an affirmation of what intention you want to happen for the center based upon the generosity of the other people in this room. And then your cardstock will go into this, and because they're not folded, they will end up stacked. And what this will be is a jar of possibility of what you would like to see happen 
with the generosity of people who donate to this center, for example. And then this jar is going to reside on our altar for uh, the year 2015. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to be in, uh, in giving mode. And I'm really looking forward to, to how that, how that um, reveals itself. Have any of you seen a show called The Deadliest Catch? Some of you haven't. It's on Discovery Channel. And The Deadliest Catch is a, is a, uh, a show. It's a, it's a series based upon um, the observation of uh, crab fishing boats in the Bering Sea. And apparently, crab fishermen have one of the top five most dangerous jobs in the world. And the way that it works is all of these competing crab fishing boats are out in the Bering Sea. Some of them have cameras upon them, not all of them, but some of them have cameras upon them. And, and we get a chance to watch these fishermen in the most in one of the five most dangerous jobs in the world, and we sit down and eat our popcorn and watch this because it's very entertaining. And, and, and um, we do, and I like it a lot. It's because it's majestic to watch what happens when people come together and watch ingenuity and watch how people can move from can't to can. Well, there's one particular episode that's, that's moving me today, and, and Simon Sinek in one of his videos triggered the remembrance of it, and so I watched it again online, and you can watch it too. A particularly rough and treacherous raging storm was happening and the ships quickly had to pull in their crab pots, which are the cages, and they pulled them up onto the decks of the ship and they chained them down so that they don't get thrown overboard in, in the turmoil and in the tumult. And, and um, one of the ships that didn't have the cameras on it had a man, uh, a uh, crewman who was climbing on the, the crab pots, um, chaining them and carabiner, carabinering them away and strapping them to the ship while one of the ships that had a camera on it was watching this. Now, these are competing ships. They are competing. They compete to get the most crabs, to make the most money, and to be the best on the show. They are competing. When a wave came over and washed along the side of the boat and when the wave left the man who was on the, the, the crab pots was gone. He was down in the water and he was yelling please don't let me die. Now in that water in one minute and thirty seconds humankind experiences hypothermia, irreversible death. Ninety seconds. Well, the captain of the ship that's observing this completely throws the ship forward and tears out towards this man and the entire crew is leaning over, holding on to each other with nets and, and, um, and poles and ropes and they drag this young man, their competitor, out of the water and they tear off his clothes and pile onto him blankets and bodies and, and warmth and, and save him. And the captain comes down the captain comes down and picks up this kid and gives him a hug like he's the long lost son that the captain hasn't seen in so long. And I can't help but watch this and think that all of the people on that boat that day, the competing boat, were probably not happy about their catch that they lost, not happy about being um, in danger in this storm. We're not happy necessarily with their work, but I bet you they went to sleep that night fulfilled. We're not a self-help church. We're not here just to help lift you into the best you that you can be. That's a great place to start. Mary Teresa set us up beautifully for that. That's a great foundation. But that's not all that we're up to. That's, that's like elementary. That's the beginning. That's the place from which you begin to see the light. But then it's time for you to be the light. And the way that we are the light is by moving through the world generously, giving because you're called to give, of your time and your attention, and, and I'm very grateful to be here with you and explore that together. Let's pray together, shall we? Now, there's only one, one life, and I'm comforted by that. There's only one life. There isn't two lives or four lives or 12 lives. There's only one life. 
and that life is the thing itself. There's not two lives, one being God and one being the devil. There's only one life. Now in this one life, there's contrast. Hot and cold, happy and sad, rich and poor, up and down, salty and sweet. But not two, one. And if there's anything in my mind or my being right now that is experiencing duality, the turmoil between good and bad, right and wrong, moral and immoral, kindness and hostility, I realize that I can reconcile it. I'm a choice. And so is everyone within earshot of my voice. So the purpose of this prayer is for me to make a declaration and take a stand. And the stand that I take is that this week the world is made brighter and sweeter and more vivid and more generous because of you. And that's our task and our call and our challenge. And I take it on. And I'll stand for it. And nothing's going to stop it. The peace on earth I've been waiting for has just begun. And so it is. So friends, the ushers are going to come and help us forward with the sharing of our gifts and tithes and offerings. And while they do, I invite you to say with me our giving affirmation. I deserve to be happy, prosperous, and well. Everyone deserves to be happy, prosperous, and well. I attract opulence because I am attuned to the abundant nature of the universe.
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, our praise team. You're awesome. That's our praise and worship team with Michelle. And, of course, our musicians who are awesome. Thank you, everyone. And hi, I'm Susan. It's time for Weekend Update, and <laughs> I have some news correspondents with me who are going to tell you what's happening. Hello, me again. On behalf of the Women's Connection, I want to invite you to plan on attending our Thanksgiving Eve celebration called Bowls of Thanksgiving. What we do is on the night before Thanksgiving, we transform the kitchen into a soup kitchen. Fellowship Hall is filled with tables. We enjoy homemade soup and have a, a brief informal uh, service of gratitude. Um, and in preparation for that, I want to invite you to create a soup bowl in the next week or two uh, at Petroglyph in Willow Glen. They have generously donated the sitting fee for us. So the only cost is going to be whatever soup bowl you choose to paint. Um, you just go and you say, I'm with CSL, and they, they get you all set up. Uh, you can do that anytime the next two weeks or you can join us this Friday night at 6 o'clock. Women's Connections Eat, Play, Love is going to be um, playing with ceramics. Um, the fun thing about Petroglyph, if you haven't been, is that they allow you to bring snacks and adult beverages. So, yay! So please join us. You do need to RSVP because we, we have reserved space. So you need to... There, you talk to Julie Moss, her number is in the bulletin, on the flyers, on the website, on the Facebook page, everywhere. Um, can I talk about the retreat? Oh, yes. Please. As long as I'm here and I have the microphone. Um, the next day, which is Saturday, Women's Connection is sponsoring a mini women's retreat. Uh, we, it's being put on by Sister Spirit Retreats, and it'll be from 2 to 7 o'clock. It is free. And if you've ever wondered what a, a full women's spiritual retreat is, this is a great opportunity to just come and enjoy all the little elements that we do at a women's retreat. So um, join us here. It's a potluck. Bring something to eat, something to share. Um, it would be great to have you. Oh, cool. And to you. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt, and uh, I'm a member of this community, and I'm here to talk about membership. So twice a year, we have an awesome membership ceremony, and I am on the team this year with Marsha and Liz to create an awesome membership day. Now, the only requirement for membership here is there's a two-hour class. It's on November 9th. Uh, it's two hours from 1 to 3 o'clock. It's upstairs. Dr. David will be up there. I'll be up there. And it's a really cool opportunity to learn about the center, about our leadership, and what we're up to around here. Membership is a really cool thing uh, at the Center for Spiritual Living. Who's a member? Who's a member? Lots of people are members here. And I've been a member for 11 years. And the thing I love about this place and being a member, there is no us and them. It is you. You are them. And being a member of the center is w one step closer to being a part of that. So I'm going to be in Fellowship Hall after service. You can stop by and get more information about membership and the uh, two-hour class in November. And then we have a ceremony later on that month. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Paula. I love that you can bring adult beverages so you know all those bowls that look like little shot glasses. <laughs> You're going to know who made those. Um, <laughs> other stuff this week that's coming up on Wednesday night, we have our, our satsang where we have the opportunity to gather at 6.30 and to experience 30 minutes of being in the silence with one another and then a brief sharing. And also on Wednesday night, Dr. David is doing his uh, fourth quarter drop-in group, and this group is all about money um, and you and your spiritual uh, thinking about money. So that's at 5.45 on Wednesday. Paula told you about the women's retreat next Sunday. For those of you who are part of our usher team, there is a potluck and planning meeting, meeting and that's at 1230 next Sunday. Uh, Matt told you about the new member class. Oh, I wanted to tell you about, oh. Hi. Matt wanted, uh, no, I wanted to tell you about Amazon.com. I mentioned it a week or so ago. Center for Spiritual Living uh, 
is now available for your support on Amazon Smile. And what that means is if you log into Amazon Smile and then designate Center for Spiritual Living as your uh, nonprofit organization, then every time you shop at Amazon, they give us money. And it, I know, right? And I mean, how often do you shop at Amazon? I'm out there like daily. In fact, I should have bought stock a long time ago. But <laughs> so please, um, if you have any questions, you can read about it in the bulletin, or and it's right on the home page, the landing page of our website as well. Um, after service, for those of you who would like to hear a little bit more about Fellowship One, because we talk about it every now and then, like if you want to register for a class or if you're new here and you want to create a profile, log on to Fellowship One. But Max Overland um, will be available at the concierge table after service. So he can actually give you like a little hands-on demo if you want to know, like if you want to upload your profile picture or if you even want to know what it is. But Fellowship One is our people care system. And again, it allows you to create a profile so that when you want to register for classes or buy tickets for events, it's easy peasy. And um, if you move and want to change your address, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, so all that good information is available through Fellowship One, and Max can give you a quick how-to. And, oh, next Sunday, also, next Sunday at 1230, our core council is going to host a brief town hall meeting so that we can tell you about the exciting plans for the property, our back 40 property. It's on the other side of the meditation garden that faces Delmas Avenue. Awesome things are happening. Um, so it's a secret. You, I can't tell you till next Sunday. Um, so we're really very excited about that. Lastly, if there's anything in your life for which you would like prayer, if you take a seat in the chapel area right there by the candle after service, our practitioners would be happy to pray with you. It's our gift. It's free. And we love you. Have a great week, everyone. Also on Fellowship One, I understand it's um, if you have a if you have a, uh, a profile on Fellowship One, you can list on your profile what your profession is so that any and one of us that has a profile and we're actually looking for, let's say, because we're now new homeowners here, a plumber or a window washer or a, a marriage attorney or, <laughs> or, or you're looking for your business, it's going to be like a church directory as well. But you're the one who will input your information. We only have the information that you put in there. So uh, if you want to know how to do that, see Max in Fellowship Hall. Right. Please stand and take the hand of the person on your right and on your left. And as is our custom, won't you please repeat after me, something wonderful is happening as me right now. Something wonderful is happening as me right now. It's this thing called life. It's this thing called life. Life is in my mind. Life is in my, mind. Life, is in my body. life is in my body. Life is in my relationships. Life is in my relationships. Life is in my finances. Life is in my finances. Life is in the cure for Ebola. Life is in the cure for Ebola. I see it. I see it. I think it. I feel, it. I feel it. I believe it. I, believe it. I accept it. I, accept it. I, express it. I express it. Just the way that it is. And just the way that it is not. Thank you, life.